Okay, so thanks uh, for joining us, everybody. We have a great session today with Dr. Keith Kaufman of um, Mercy Children's Mercy Hospital or Mercy Children's Hospital in Kansas City. And so um, just as a little bit of background in terms of what this was about, a year ago, we did a survey of our community and had uh, over 200 responses. We were just uh, starting to include GRIA then. So there's a smaller number of GRIA families, just 15. Um, but we asked families not only what symptoms did their children have, but what were the most pressing issues for those families? What were the symptoms that they would most want to see addressed? And um, the, the first two were not really surprising. Um, the, the first one was around intellectual disability and, and communication. The second one was around epilepsy. And then the third one was this grouping of, um, of things that, that families put down that were either having to do with mood or behavior or neurostorms. And um, I don't think that all of these are the same, but I think there's probably a lot of overlap. And many of, of these, uh, what families were reporting and, and are seeing as the top priority are areas that I think um, are related to what Dr. Kaufman is going to be speaking to us about today. So um, I think in, in Grin 2D, there was a small sample and we didn't have anyone there say that this was a top priority for them. But among all of the other genes, um, including GRIA as a whole, this was something that was um, quite a prominent issue for, for people. And uh, it's also a personal issue for me. So my son Bryson, um, I'm gonna be showing a video of one of his episodes later, but for years we've been trying to understand uh, these episodes that, that he has. Um, Bryson's been on three different seizure medications to try to treat them, even though they um, haven't shown up on an EEG. Um, we had one neurologist once that, that saw one and could, could tell that something was going on that he thought might be um, epileptic, uh, even though it wasn't showing up on the EEG. But really it's been a search for over 10 years to try to understand um, what's going on. And uh, recently we've had some success with some medications and, and uh, although Bryson's had, had a, a hard, <laughs> hard night last night and a hard time this morning, uh, these, these kind of breakthroughs are still happening, but generally um, he's, he's doing uh, better now. And um, I think it relates to, again, to some of what uh, Dr. Kaufman is gonna talk about and, and the potential treatments uh, to, to help with that. Um, we're also working with Dr. Kaufman and a number of other rare disease organizations to, um, to try and, and do some research around these episodes among um, children in each of our groups that, that have them with the goal of hopefully having, getting this to a point where it's more widely recognized among um, you know, the, the community, not just of, of families, but, but clinicians as well. As this is something that, that is not well understood among um, physicians, including neurologists. So um, with that, welcome Dr. Kaufman. Thanks for joining us and over to you. Thanks for having me. Um, so the, the title of this talk, um, you know, basically it covers what these episodes can look like. Um, so, you know, hot, stiff and twitchy or cool, floppy and sleepy. It's not a seizure, but it's not normal, okay? Um, so really walk through how to identify symptoms of dysautonomia in a child uh, who's medically complex and be aware of, of treatment options. Um, so what is dysautonomia? So first one has to understand what is the autonomic nervous system? So it is responsible for things that uh, are automatic, okay? So heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, gut motility, bowel and bladder control, sweating, fight or flight, arousal, sleep-wake cycles, okay? This is where the autonomic nervous system exists within the human body, right? So if you look at it, starting at the eyes and going all the way down to the rectum and the bladder and it is the entirety of the human body is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. The one piece um, that is not represented uh, very well on this 
figure, um, but will be very clear as we watch the videos that were sent. And thank to all of you who sent the videos. They are some of the most um, striking examples of this phenomenon um, as I watched them the other day um, is skin. So skin is the one organ um, that is incredibly innervated by the autonomic nervous system that is not done justice by this figure, but you'll see very clearly in the videos um, why it's important to know that that's the case. So the autonomic nervous system itself is broken down into um, three arms, okay, or three sections. So there's the enteric nervous system. And disorders of autonomic function affect the GI system because there are more neurons in the gut than there are in the spinal cord, okay? So if you think about the fact that, that your entirety of your intestinal tract is innervated by this system, any difficulties with bowel or bladder control, uh, specifically bowel control, feeding intolerance, it's because of an issue with the autonomic nervous system, okay? Then there are the two most classic arms that people think about, which is the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is the part of your autonomic nervous system that excites the body. It works very quickly, it turns on very quickly. And from a neurology standpoint, the cell body, so the nerve endings are far away from the target organs. Um, Whereas in the parasympathetic, this is the slow acting and the inhibitory part of the autonomic nervous system. So you can see immediately where you can run into problems if you have a dysregulation of your autonomic nervous system because the two arms, the parasympathetic and sympathetic, directly compete um, with each other and have opposite reactions. So imbalance of activity between the two arms leads to symptoms that are pervasive. Okay, so then we have to talk about where in the brain does this happen? Um, so the main site of action, if you will, within the central nervous system for autonomic control is the hypothalamus. Um, so that area alone controls and has the nerve cells that generate functions for hunger, thirst, circadian rhythm, which is sleep-wake cycle, um, temperature, pain as well. Um, and one of the videos that we'll watch today, um, I, I will walk you through how very clearly um, the one young man is expressing pain with his episodes um, as best he can, um, being nonverbal. And then the area, so the hypothalamus lives directly in the center of the brain, actually pretty much at the intersection between this line and this line. So right between the eyes and right down the center of the brain. Um, so it's a very small region of brain, very primitive region of brain um, that is present throughout mammals. Um, okay, and then the midbrain is exactly that. It's where in the middle of the brain. And then you've got groups of neurons um, called the raphe nuclei, and that's where serotonin is produced. And serotonin, you think mood, behavior, pain, um, depression, and then the substantia nigra, which literally stands for black substance. Um, neuroanatomists are not creative people. Um, is where your dopamine neurons live. So dopamine is heart rate, blood pressure, reward, motivation, okay? And then your sympathetic trunk. So this is a part of the autonomic nervous system that goes all the way down next to the spinal cord. Um, and it has nerve cells that regulate autonomic function that cover that region from the base of the brain all the way down to the bottom of the human body. So in a general sense, and these are not terms that are published because as Keith said, um, very little has been published in this regard, uh, especially in the pediatric population. Um, so there are two types of autono dysautonomias um, that, that exist. And part of the reason for the research that he mentioned 
is trying to convince the greater medical and scientific community, uh, well, not convince, prove to them what many of us already know, that these conditions exist. So the two types um, are sort of hot, wet, agitated, irritable, and stiff. And the videos today will really talk about those very well. And then the other are sort of cold, dry, sleepy, and floppy. And I don't have any videos of that, um, but I'll be able to compare and contrast, okay? Um, most people who have autonomic dysfunction typically have one or the other. Uh, it's rare for people to have both, uh, but it is possible, okay? So in the term that I use to sort of help people understand uh, sort of hot dysautonomia, um, what you see is um, you see events um, that occur in patients and um, the events are very characteristic. Um, can everyone see this young man mm -hmm. named Bryson? Okay. So as I watched Bryson's videos, um, some, some things became very clear as I was watching this. Um, so one of the things that becomes very clear is that this young man is incredibly uncomfortable during these events. Um, and the further the event goes on, the more uncomfortable he gets. And you can see he gets more and more agitated. And as you walk through the video, the thing that's striking I want to get to his feet. Okay, so we're going to let it run here. And you'll see, you see how red his hands are? They are profoundly red. His face is not. It's a little bit red, but his hands are profoundly red. And if you look at his hands compared to either mom or dad's hands, I don't know which, uh, you can see the incredibly stark contrast between the colors. And then when you see his feet in this video, and I don't know why it's doing this. Um, I was not having this problem yesterday. So there again are the hands, and then we'll watch his feet as the video progresses. you got a glimpse of his ankle there. And again, it's doing this. And I'm not touching anything, so it must be the link. Um, okay. Sorry if I'm making anyone motion sick. I don't have any idea why it's doing this. Because I'm not. Okay. So there you can see his foot is as red as his hand. Um, and you compare that to his neck, which you can see is of normal skin color, and just how profoundly red. And at points in the video, um, he, ah, there they are. There are those profoundly red feet. And look at those feet in comparison to his ankle right above the foot. I mean, that is a profoundly red and most likely very painful looking foot. So what happens in these events is you get this sudden output of autonomic activity and you get this redness, uh, you get this agitation, as you can see, he becomes very, very agitated, understandably so. Um, and at points in the video, um, he tries to show his parents, sort of takes his hand, brings it to their hand to his leg, sort of grabbing at his leg as well as you saw him grabbing at his parents' hands. It, clearly, this, the areas that are red are painful and uncomfortable to him by watching the video. Um, okay, so the next one. Um, First, I want to show you the video of this young woman's pupils. 
You can see her pupils are tremendously dilated. <clears throat> Pupillary dilatation like this, you only typically see in the dark. But as you can see, it's very, very bright where she is. Lots of natural light, yet her pupils are incredibly large. The pupils are innovated by the autonomic nervous system. And pupillary dilatation is something you see with autonomic activation uh, because you're letting more light in in your state of sort of panic, fear, um, fight or flight. Okay. So um, so you can see she is incredibly uncomfortable. And look how incredibly red her face is. I'm going to take you back and show you, right? And you can see a very distinct pattern. You can see cheeks, nose, chin, and in comparison, the other parts of her face that are not red. Um, and she's exceptionally uncomfortable because she has this thing going on and she clearly feels scared, painful, it's un known because um, she's not able to tell us, but this is, you know, one of the things we see in these episodes of autonomic storming is this incredible sense of feeling uncomfortable, scared, pain. Um, I was actually um, um, watching her video yesterday made me cry, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, because then you see after the episode and you can see her and see that this is how she, she looks between these episodes. Um, it's like two different people. Um, and that's why, thankfully, I was sitting in my office with the door closed, um, crying about this. Um, um, okay, and then... You can see here another child, again, with, with, again, this very agitated, very red, you can even tell in the low lighting. But what you also see here is all of this extra movement. And, you know, it's, it's very challenging to tell how much of this movement is voluntary versus involuntary. And the thing with these autonomic storming events, and we'll walk through this as we go through the talk, now that I've shown you the kinds of things that, that I'm referring to, is that there are people who have these bursts of autonomic activity and have development of movement abnormalities with the, the autonomic storming. Um, okay, so... We're gonna go back to the slides and, and thank all of you parents who sent these videos. As I said, these are, are striking examples. Um, so one of the things with these events, they can be periodic. They can occur specifically at different times of the day. They can occur for some patients on a schedule. Um, you know, typically in some patients, they may happen at a set time of day or around the same time every day when they occur. And that's because they come from the hypothalamus where your circadian rhythms, your natural body rhythms live, right? So it's very common when I see patients who have these kind of events for parents to say, yeah, every day at three o'clock, four o'clock, whatever for, for my child, um, um, really helps to make sense of these. Um, as you've all heard, and any of you whose children have had this, the big thing is, you know, it, are these seizures, are these ictal events? And universally, the EEGs are unremarkable, unrevealing, and, and we'll talk about why that's the case. Um, and, you know, in, in some individuals, there may be MRI findings or CT findings showing loss of tissue in the third ventricle, but this is not proven to be a universal finding, okay? Um, in contrast, in stark contrast, uh, what I refer to uh, is as cold dysautonomia is basically the exact opposite of what you saw. 
So these are people who have significant sedation with low body temperature. They're pale, they're cool, um, and their heart rate is slow. They have what's called bradycardia. So the exact opposite of what you saw there in those videos of those three children. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump to um, how do you work up children who have that second problem, the one we haven't talked about? Um, what you do there is uh, I always obtain what's called cerebral spinal fluid neurotransmitter uh, metabolite analysis. So you can actually find um, low levels of dopamine and serotonin metabolites uh, in children who have this problem, uh, and then uh, sometimes less rare, less commonly, you can find low levels of methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is a folic acid metabolite, and you can inform treatment by seeing if you have neurotransmitter deficiencies um, and replace them, okay? And what you do in those particular cases is if your dopamine levels are low, your homovanillic acid, you use medication to improve dopamine levels. Uh, you can use another medication called amantadine, uh, which will also increase dopamine activity. And you can use medications that increase serotonin levels if your serotonin metabolites are low, okay? And then you can use things like steroid hormones to increase fluid retention and psychostimulants uh, that you would use to treat ADHD to improve the heart rate and the blood pressure, okay? Um, but that's not the kind of episodes that we're talking about. I wanted to make sure that the full spectrum of disorders of autonomic function was covered. Um, so now we're gonna talk about dystonia before we then link um, dystonia and dysautonomia uh, or autonomic storming together and the scientific entity that people know exists and really what these phenomenon are um, because there is a medical term for it finally. Um, so dystonia is a movement disorder and it's characterized by the co-contraction of muscles that both flex and extend a joint sufficient to induce a posture. And you could see, you know, uh, all three of the individual videos, you could see that they had abnormal posturing. Um, the young, the first young man, uh, Bryson, you could see that his feet were held in an odd position. Uh, the young woman, you could see uh, as, her, as her parents scrolled down to her legs, you could see her feet were turned. Um, and then the third young man who was laying on his back, you could see some abnormal posturing of his uh, elbows and some movements of his hands. Um, so dystonia is the third most common movement disorder on planet Earth uh, behind what's called essential tremor and uh, tick disorders, including Tourette syndrome. The key thing with dystonia compared to other disorder, hyperkinetic movement disorders is dystonia is very painful, right? So what happens when you have muscles that both flex and extend is that your muscles are locked in place and it's extremely painful to have this happen. Think about it as if you're doing something like planks nonstop, uh, uncontrollably, your body is making your muscles contract, okay? Um, dystonia in and of itself can lead to severe constipation and reflux because if you have dystonia of your muscles of your abdomen, muscles of your back, muscles of your pelvic floor, you can't generate enough relaxation to evacuate your bowels or evacuate your bladder. Um, so then you go to the entity of dystonia with dysautonomia, which is what it used to be called. Um, the original term for this going back into uh, the, the early 2000s was paroxysmal, so sudden onset, autonomic instability with dystonia. Um, so that's what the original term was by Dr. Ro uh, Robert Rust um, and his research group at the University of Virginia many, many years ago. 
Um, what we now know, the, the term is now universally agreed upon, is that this phenomenon is called paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity, or PSH. And what happens is this, what occurs in patients with severe brain disease, whether it be neurogenetic in nature, brain trauma, near drowning, it's most well known to exist, uh, well known to be described, excuse me, in patients who have had head trauma or near drowning. We are starting to show um, that these kind of phenomenon can occur in patients with monogenic neurodevelopmental disorders, monogenic developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So we published some work last year, uh, Dr. Ann Berg, Dr. Deborah Gabler, Gabler Spira and I, um, in our heterogeneous group of children with DEEs and showed that autonomic dysfunction um, occurs in these children, regardless of etiology, um, by a, a survey that we had that they had done, we're also starting to see um, in work that I'm doing with the SCN2A community that uh, these kind of disorders of autonomic function occur in children with SCN2A, both in gain of function and loss of function mutation. So both the patients who have predominantly epilepsy, as well as the patients who have predominantly the autism phenotype. So it does not matter whether you've got a gain or function or loss of function mutation, for many of these conditions, you can have this occur. So back years and years ago, going back into the 90s, um, it was thought this, uh, these were of thalamic uh, origin. Uh, we now know, as we mentioned earlier, they are hypothalamic in origin. So, as you saw in the three members of your community, um, what happens with these episodes, severe, often generalized dystonic posturing, and how much of the discomfort that all three kids were having was because of involuntary movement versus the autonomic storm itself, we don't know yet because we haven't asked the right questions. Temperature can go up. Temperature can be very, very high with these conditions. Um, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. As you can see um, more from the second and third uh, individuals because of the, the problem that I had with the video and the third individual, um, first individual, breathing rate goes up. And then you saw the sweating, right? And uh, obviously mistaken for seizure. And, you know, they can last minutes to multiple hours. Um, as you saw, they're exhausting, painful, and as you heard, you know, they often don't respond to treatment from anticonvulsants or benzodiazepines, and, and that's because where these come from um, is a part of the brain that those particular medications don't touch, okay? So anticonvulsants, for the most part, or anti-seizure medications or anti-epileptic medications, same term, or three different terms for the same type of medication. So the way almost all of those medications work is they work on the surface of the brain to decrease nerve cell firing rate um, at the surface, okay? Benzodiazepines, um, so Ativan, or lorazepam, diazepam, midazolam, uh, clonazepam, clorazepate, they all work by increasing the activity of GABA so you increase neuronal inhibition. Um, but again, they don't really work to treat this problem because of where, where the problem is and what the neurotransmitters are, okay? Um, the most frustrating thing about treating these paroxysmal sympathetic activity, hyperactivity events is when they occur, and I'm sure any of you whose children have experienced this, um, trying to use medications as they're happening doesn't work. You can't stop these once they occur. So you have to prevent them from happening. Um, so how do you prevent them? Well, there's actually very little data about what's effective um, because no one has done the kind of work that we're hoping to do to really figure out why they happen and what works to treat them. Um, so there exists, thankfully, 
a diagnosis tool for this. Um, and as Keith mentioned, part of the work that we're looking to do for the greater um, neurodevelopmental disabilities community is to really characterize, quantify, and, and demonstrate to the greater medical and scientific communities um, that this is a thing that happens in children with conditions uh, like the GRIN-related disorders, as well as other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So there are two tools, a diagnosis likelihood tool and a clinical feature scale, okay, um, as well as the assessment measure. So what these tools, and these are published peer-reviewed uh, literature tools, um, and it's a very simple thing, right? Um, clinical features occur simultaneously, sudden onset, um, symptom overreactivity, um, more than two episodes a day, absence of parasympathetic features, okay? And then uh, the clinical feature scale looks at, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, sweating, um, and then you add them together and there is even a pediatric version of this where you can use you know, patient age, heart rate, blood pressure, um, localized sweating, generalized sweating, uh, generalized movement. So you can really score in terms of severity these events, okay? Um, so how do you treat these? What do we do right now for treatment of these events um, when you're trying to um, help your children in the present. Okay, so one of the biggest thing is non-pharmacologic measures. Okay, so the autonomic nervous system is incredibly sensitive to perturbations of any part of the human body. Okay, so if your, your child has um, these types of events, Think about, are there things environmentally that could be triggering these? Do they happen as soon as we get home from school? Do they happen as we ride in the car? Do they happen in response to loud noise? Uh, do they happen more on days that we're having problems with constipation? So think about, you know, as a, as a both movement disorder neurologist and neurodevelopmentalist, one of the big things in my field is behavior, okay? Um, so as a behavioral neurologist, you think about the ABCs. Um, so A is antecedent. So with any of your children that have these events, can you identify things that are consistently causing the events to occur, whether it be temperature, environment, sound, time of day, situation, whatever, um, that's leading to these events, okay? Um, so is it keeping the room at a cooler temperature, lower stimulation environment, um, if sleep is disrupted, um, because the hypothalamus is involved in sleep-wake cycles, if one of your child's biggest struggles is an inconsistent sleep schedule, then with that inconsistent sleep schedule, these events are occurring more and more and more, work with your treating physicians to say, hey, you know, sleep is really, really not great. And as a result of that, we're having more and more of these other kinds of events. Can we focus more on sleep to get sleep better? Okay, um, and I'll back up a second. Um, other things, um, here we go, other things, um, that I was thinking this morning that I needed to add to this but ran out of time to do is um, things like clothing, okay? If you find a particular piece of clothing um, that you know is more likely to uh, have this happen. So think about if your child wears any kind of orthotic bracing of any kind, is, is the brace rubbing somewhere on his or her body whenever you take the brace off that there's an area of redness or an area of skin irritation and it is the development or worsening of the autonomic episodes um, in, in response to new bracing. 
Um, if your child requires mobility device, uh, wheelchair or kid cart or something of that nature, it is positioning in wherever he or she is seated contributing to it because not every chair supports and um, gives great body position. So if you find that a certain position of your child's body um, is more likely to cause these events to occur, then think about how position change um, within seating devices, within beds um, could be contributing. Um, and then the other thing I forgot to include um, are smells, okay? So our sense of smell is our most primitive sense. Um, sense of smell actually is the one sensory modality that is immediately uh, sent to, uh, from peripheral organ to uh, central nervous system without being processed. So our sense of smell goes directly from our nose to uh, the amygdala and to other areas of brain that generate our fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, so certain smells, noxious smells, um, activate the autonomic nervous system because they're distressing smells, okay? So, um, and it's the most basic of all human response, of, of most all animal responses is that smell bothers me, I need to get away from it. So uh, positioning and smell is, are the other things that I wanted to add. Okay, so when I talk about treatment, so treating these events um, requires prophylactic treatment. You have to keep the episodes from occurring. And since we're dealing with the autonomic nervous system, you have to use medications that dial down autonomic nervous system activity, okay, which anticonvulsants and benzodiazepines don't do. Um, we talked about where they work. So the autonomic nervous system agents that have the most benefit are, are what are called the alpha-2 agonists. So um, these medications work on neurons that signal and release what's called norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline. And these agents work before the synapse. So they work before the neurons release the norepinephrine. And what they do is they prevent the release of norepinephrine, noradrenaline, at the synapse. They therefore reduce the brain's ability to generate these profound sympathetic outputs by simply making it impossible to generate the severity of the response, okay? And that's why these medications are used to treat high blood pressure, which essential hypertension, so uh, high blood pressure that happens without a problem in the kidney is really a brain-generated phenomenon. Um, so that's why these agents are used to treat blood, high blood pressure that comes from the brain. And these medications are very, very kid-friendly and safe. They're actually FDA approved in the United States for the non-stimulant, so non-Ritalin treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So these medications are widely used in children, are very safely used in children, and are exceptionally effective at preventing these autonomic storms or paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity events from happening, okay? They come um, in the United States, um, these agents come in both tablets um, that are extended release, tablets that are immediate release, and transdermal skin patches um, that you change once a week. So the way that I treat these is, um, I start off using the immediate release tablets and if a child has a gastrostomy tube or jejunostomy tube and is not able to swallow medications by mouth, um, you just take the tablet and you crush it and you um, put it in the tube with some liquid. And once you titrate, so you, what I do is I work with all of my patients who have these to find the right dose to prevent the episodes from happening. And if that ends up being a dose that um, is a nice uh, even number, um, then what I will do at that point is 
transition them from tablets to transdermal skin patches. So they get sustained inhibition of their autonomic nervous system um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to prevent these events from occurring so that they have a better quality of life um, and not suffer from these things. Okay. Sometimes those don't work and we need to use beta blockers. So beta blockers, so the alpha neurons and the beta neurons are different parts of the sympathetic nervous system, the different parts of different types of neurons within the sympathetic nervous system, excuse me. And sometimes you use beta blockade. Um, so beta blockade works similar to alpha blockade. Get a little bit more side effects with beta blockade than you do with alpha blockade, which is why I don't use them first line. Um, you get much more heart rate slowing with beta blockers than you do with alpha blockers. Um, so propranolol, which you see listed there, is the medication that has the most effect. Um, it is used to treat patients with high blood pressure as well, uh, but it's also used to treat patients who have pathologically high heart rates. So the biggest rate limiting factor in using propranolol is you can really make someone's heart slow and they end up with problems with exercise and activity tolerance. Um, uh, so that's why I prefer alpha agents um, clinically. So the last agent that we use is baclofen. So baclofen um, works on GABA B neurons, not GABA A neurons, which is where your benzodiazepines work. Um, and we use baclofen if we've got problems with muscle tone and, and spastic movements, dystonic movements, in addition to the autonomic symptoms, because if you've got dystonia at baseline that when activated makes your parasympathetics or paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity events worse, you've got to control the movement in addition to controlling the autonomic output, okay? Um, and then from a pain standpoint, one of the most effective agents for nerve type pain, um, think about uh, the first young man, Bryson, and his very red, very painful hands and feet by the looks of it, um, gabapentin is one of the most effective medications to treat nerve type pain. And if it's pain that's driving these events, um, that works very well, gabapentin, to prevent the pain that makes the events happen. Okay. Um, and that's all the formal slides I have because I wanted to sort of give you the overview and thought process and a better understanding of what these events are and then the rest of the time open to questions, thoughts, ideas, anything that anyone uh, has on their mind. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman. Um, I think I told you this the first time that I spoke with you, but this is so um, affirming you know, to, to us as parents because we've just spent so long and, and just like just speaking from my own family in so many situations where you know, we, we had one neurologist who said, they're, they're not seizures, there's nothing I could do. Um, and kind of, we said, well, there's something, like, what do we do about them? And he referred us to, um, you know, behavior therapy. And um, so there's just, it, it's, you know, there's a, a lot of, we, we've just felt skepticism about whether there's really something, um, a, a medical, a real medical reason for these. And so, uh, it's great to hear your talk. So, so thank you. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Before we, we do take questions, I just want to mention and, and make sure everyone's aware that we are recording this. Our plan is to put it up in on, on Kiergren's YouTube channel. Um, so you can, if you ask questions in the chat, uh, Megan or I can ask them to Dr. Kaufman. Um, we won't use your name or your child's name, but if you want to ask a question directly and you're okay with that being uh, on YouTube, you can, you can take your... Um, mic off and, and speak that way so yeah um, i have received a question from a parent so i'll go ahead and start um the question from this particular parent was regarding autonomic breathing um they wanted to know is this autonomic breathing also a kind of neurostorming or is it a deep brain seizure they said that one doctor happened to suggest this um in addition to that they also wanted to know uh th they noted that 
their child doesn't show any uh, signs on EEG, are there any other tests besides from O2 stats monitoring that could be done to identify where the problem is coming from? Are there any treatments that can help with autonomic conditions related to this breathing problem? Um, and they wanted to thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, the, the, the central control of respiration um, or breathing um, is also a, a very basic primitive um, uh, function, right? So it is regulated by multiple points in the brain below the surface of the brain, so below the cortex. So that is why nothing shows up on EEG um, to, to really determine what's going on there. Um, there are ways to evaluate abnormal patterns of breathing. Um, you know, the most reliable, most proven test um, is what's called a polysomnogram or sleep study. Um, sleep studies don't just look at sleep, they also look at patterns of respiration and they can, they can indicate because you not only record brain activity, but you record O2 sat and you record patterns of breathing with monitors around the chest wall, um, that's the best way to detect abnormal patterns of breathing. Um, you know, I have um, almost all of my patients who have um, PSH um, have unusual patterns to their breathing whenever these events occur. Um, and some of them more severely affected. So children who are not able to walk, unable to talk, um, um, maybe G-tube dependent, may have a tracheostomy um, because their brain uh, disease is so severe. Even without paroxysmal events, they will have periods where their breathing patterns are incredibly odd um, and atypical. Um, you know, in today's world, um, what we do as an institution, um, not just me in, in the world of uh, movement disorders, neurology, um, but our entire division um, has two separate email servers um, for patients and families um, to send us videos of unusual things that their children are doing. Um, because with today's technology, um, it's incredibly, as you saw, the quality of the video, three videos that we watched were impeccably good. Um, and I was able to dissect out and, and see so much phenomenology occurring in those three children by high quality video. So what I would say is, you know, if you're, what I tell my patients and families and all of us in our neurology group in, in Kansas City, at Children's Mercy Kansas City, if your child's doing it, but we haven't seen it, get it on video, send it to us. We'll look at the videos when we'll get back to you on what we think. And a big part of what we do in our group is we share the videos back and forth. Maybe one of my epilepsy colleagues has a patient who's doing something different and they say, okay, this is a Keith problem, that this is something, I know it's not my problem, it's a Keith problem, let him take a look at it. And likewise, I receive videos from uh, physicians all over the world um, with unusual things um, and, you know, sort of video consults. Hey, Dr. Kaufman, I heard you talk about this or that. Um, you know, I saw your presentation on movement disorders at the Child Neurology Society last year. Um, can you take a look at this video and tell me what you think it is and what I should do to help? Um, you know, so that's the best way. Um, and if your physician is not um, interested um, in, in trying to figure out what they are, um, maybe it's your neurologist that's not interested, then maybe your, your pediatrician or your general practitioner, find someone on your care, on your child's care team who said, you know what, let me ask around. Um, um, because, you know, 
we really are in the world of pediatric neurology, a worldwide community. Um, so, you know, sharing is, is very, very possible in terms of, of videos. So in terms of treating disordered breathing, it really depends on what the pattern is. There are so many different neurological patterns of breathing. You'd be surprised at how many different ones there are. So when it comes to what is the pattern of breathing, uh, once you figure out what the pattern is, you then figure out how to treat it um, by knowing what the pattern is. Uh, because without being sure of what the pattern is, the last thing you want to affect um, inappropriately is breathing, because if you don't breathe, it's a life-ending situation. So you have to be certain what you're treating before you start to try to treat it. That certainly makes sense. We have several questions now in the chat. I'll start um, with this first question. So a uh, parent asked who would prescribe these types of medications for their child um, so they can sort that out with their care team. What would be your suggestion? So for things like this, um, you know, these particular phenomenon that I discussed today, um, the two groups of individuals who, who know about these conditions, um, because it's not just neurologists. Um, the other group of physicians besides neurologists who understand disorders of autonomic function because they see them so much in patients with brain injury or, or spinal cord injury are physiatrists, so physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors. So those are the two groups um, that, that understand these disorders the best and are most adept at treating them um, because they're the ones that see them. Certainly. Okay, we have some more questions in the chat. A couple of them are related, so I'll go ahead and combine those. But uh, a parent asked, can you speak more about the self-harm during these episodes? How does aggressive behavior towards oneself and others, uh, including excessive screaming, laughing, and... Um, and screaming fit into that? Uh, is this an expression of discomfort or pain, uh, or does this not fit into the pattern as an indicator? So, you know, those are incredibly uh, challenging questions to ask um, because of the fact that if you've got a patient who has limited to no um, ability to communicate verbally, um, you have to use deductive reasoning, okay? Um, so, you know, in, in the first, in the young woman's case, um, one could clearly see that when her face was not red, um, when she was not lying on the floor with her feet looking stuck, like I said, brief video, couldn't say for sure, you could see that she was serene, calm, okay, um, in between events, right? So whatever was occurring with that event um, made her incredibly uncomfortable and scream because when the event was not occurring, she was not doing it. And the same thing with the first young man, um, we, I received an email with a whole lot of, of detail and you know, when he's not having these events, he doesn't act the way that was seen in the video. Um, you know, the, and that's why we're, we're looking to understand more about these events and sort of what drives them is, you know, everybody that I've seen over the course of the last, when I graduated medical school 20 years, or yeah, 20 years ago this May, oh, 21 years ago this May, excuse me. Um, Everyone that I've seen over the past two decades with these kinds of events, um, the self-injurious behavior, the uh, screaming, um, uh, they're not there when they're not having these events. So clearly these events are causing the behavioral changes. Um, the behavioral changes aren't happening. Uh, they're not causing the events Right, so they're not, the children are not choosing to injure themselves. One of the questions that um, I saw pop up through the chat um, was, you know, the redness of hands and feet, and could this be erythromyalgia? 
Um, an incredibly good question. Um, so erythromyalgia or EM is a severely painful, sudden onset um, nerve mediated problem. Okay, it can be localized, it can be regional, um, it can be global. And EM um, is immensely and exquisitely painful. And what happens in EM is you get incredibly red skin, swollen skin, and incredibly painful skin. Um, because what's happening is that you've got abnormal firing of sensory nerves that are creating a pain situation where no pain has been inflicted. EM was first and best described um, in patients who have a sodium channel mutation. Um, so you know, the question is, you know, is part of this redness swelling, is this or a form frust or similar to erythromyalgia that occurs? Um, very possibly. And that's why we need to dig deeper into mechanisms and underlying mechanisms, um, because there are certain meds that work very, very well to treat EM that you would never think about using if you think the problem is purely central and autonomic in origin, um, you would use more meds that work to treat erythromyalgia. So that's a brilliant question, whoever asked it. Um, and thank you for asking it. You're, you're on mute, Megan. Sorry. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. So we still have a few more questions coming in. Uh, our next question is related to, is dysautonomia an umbrella term that embraces other types of ANS issues in nonverbal children? How can we most accurately differentiate between dysautonomia versus dystonia versus others? Um, and the parent noted that they're under treatment for red ear syndrome and paroxysmal hemicrania and looking into thoracic outlet syndrome. Sure. Um, so the question of how do we differentiate and how do we sort out um, is the purpose, uh, is sort of the, the research project in process um, that, uh, that Keith mentioned uh, earlier. So um, because the autonomic nervous system affects the entire body, um, what we need to do, uh, we, the royal we, the medical scientific we, not the we, our, this group alone, um, is to find out from patients, from families, um, using published questionnaires, published rating scales, like I showed earlier, um, that cover the full gamut of autonomic dysfunction. Okay, so in addition to the PSH scales, autonomic scales that look at gastrointestinal function, sleep-wake cycles, uh, body temperature regulation issues, um, and combine those scales with peer-reviewed published rating scales for disorders of uh, hyperkinetic involuntary movement disorders. So things like dystonia, chorea, tremor, um, to really get the data out there and to say, you know, across the board of, of neurodevelopmental disorders, the problems with autonomic dysfunction cross the whole gamut from these pH episodes to um, problems with gastrointestinal uh, function to urinary function. And these movement disorders also occur in these patients um, because then we can look at common mechanisms, right? So once we figure out how many conditions are affected by this, you then take the conditions that have similar or same types of dysautonomias, types of movement disorders, and that's when you start to do uh, high level uh, deep genetic testing. So things like proteomics, looking at protein expression and metabolism, and then metabolomics to look at things like serotonin metabolism, dopamine metabolism, to see if the different disorders that have similar phenotypic features from a dysautonomia and movement standpoint have similar or the same chemical signatures from a metabolism standpoint that you can say, okay, this group would respond to this type of medication, this group would respond to this type of medication, 
because the phenomenology and the chemistry all match up, okay? Um, and that's the, the big project um, that, that I've sort of lightning bolt hit me um, a few weeks ago when I first met Keith and, and first um, sort of made a connection that, that so many disorders like the, the Grin disorders have all of this overlap um, it, there's no scientific way that it is coincidence. It violates um, the precept known as Occam's razor, um, where, you know, the more complicated the situation, basically, the more there has to be a simple explanation as opposed to being 85 different explanations. Um, Perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question related to medication. So does using the medications mentioned positively affect other things uh, such as seizures and intellectual uh, development? So it depends on the medication. Okay. Um, you know, the one medication um, that would have, um, well, let me back up. Um, the only one of the medications that I mentioned that has potential for seizure control is gabapentin. Uh, gabapentin is FDA approved as an anticonvulsant um, and is used to treat neuropathic pain. Um, none of the other medications that I talked about would do anything for seizure control because none of them work on the surface of the brain, on the cortex of the brain. Um, the alpha-2 agonists, um, specifically, the names of those two agents, uh, chemical names of those two agents are clonidine and guanfacine. Um, those two medications, as I stated, um, are FDA approved in the United States to treat attention focus hyperactivity uh, issues. So um, improving cognitive function is possible um, with those, uh, but simply in terms of better attention focus impulse control. Um, none of the medications to, to treat uh, PSH would have any additional benefits um, in that regard. Great, thank you. We have another question related to medication. Um, and uh, this parent said that they recently started their child on gabapentin. It's only been a couple of months and they've had uh, somewhat of an effect. He does have dystonia as well. Um, and the parents wondering if some of these meds can be combined with gabapentin. So um, the best way to know whether or not um, medications can be combined, um, physicians like myself who manage medically complex patients um, use commercially available um, medication to medication interaction software. Okay, so I never prescribe a medication to a patient who's on any other medication without using a medication to medication interaction software program um, because I take care of patients like your children who are medically complex. Um, so there are multiple different um, software programs that do this. Um, and the safest way when you're managing a complex patient is take their entire medication list um, that they're currently on, then look at the interactions that may develop when you're looking to add a medication and then use that electronic guidance to do so. Um, the other way to do it um, is some institutions like our institution, um, we have PharmDs, so we have uh, doctors of pharmacy um, in our different divisions and in our neurology group, we have a phenomenal PharmD. Um, and there are times that the computer software doesn't do the best job of, of telling us whether or not there's an interaction. And then I reach out to Dr. Kennedy and say, you know, Audrey, this is what I would like to add to this child's medic medication regimen. Could you look into any potential pitfalls or, or interactions about which I need to be made aware? Um, and if that medication doesn't work, here are a couple other options about which I'm thinking, right? So um, it is, in my professional opinion, um, 
adding medications to medically complex children without taking those extra steps is unwise. So, so it was actually my question. So I just wanted to um, to um, try to explain what, what I meant because the, the sure. third patient uh, that you showed on video is Arian, my son. Um, okay. And yeah, um, and what the, the question was more um, towards whether combining some of the medication would actually be more beneficial because we, we have seen a somewhat, you know, relief with gabapentin, but not, you know, totally. <laughs> uh, so yeah. if combining some of some of the medication could actually be. So, so absolutely. And that's um, so as I was going through, you know, and I talked about, you know, the, the first agents to treat the autonomic dysfunction. And then I talked about, you know, if you've got problems like dystonia that are making your autonomic function worsen, then thinking about baclofen as well. And if pain is a driver, think about gabapentin. So yes, combining to get better effect um, is possible. Um, and, and if you're working with whomever you're working with from a physician standpoint, um, you know, taking if he or she's taking that thoughtful approach of, well, we we did this and it made benefit. Maybe this is driving the problem or that is driving the problem. So let's add this or that. Yes, very frequently in patients um, who have these episodes, um, we take a you know step one, step two, step three approach. Um, um, and I always do it as I described in terms of making sure those are safe options to do. And, and understand for the entire audience that all of these medications, um, using them to treat these uh, issues are completely off label. None of these medications are FDA approved for the things we're talking about. Um, so if you have physicians in the United States, since you know, you're a worldwide group, in terms of um, approval to use these medications to treat these specific problems, you may have a number of physicians in the United States say, you know, I'm not comfortable because that's not a medication that's FDA approved to treat this problem. Um, and that is part of the reason that we need to do better science to show that this is a problem and that we need um, to move forward to getting medications that are shown to be effective for treating this problem so your children don't have to suffer um, once we find what effective treatments actually exist. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, so our next question is related to uh, a patient who has multiple ab absences, two to three seconds, um, hypothermia and red ears, and they were curious mm -hmm. if those symptoms might also be associated um, with the PSH phenomena. Um, you know, very likely, um, and, you know, it's one of those that, um, you know, get it on video, um, and what I mean get it on video is get the whole body on video. Right, so you're seeing changes in ears and, and you're seeing changes in body temperature. For someone like myself, um, you know, I sit and watch videos and I literally look at one body part at a time to understand what I'm seeing. Um, and I pick up on things in videos um, by watching them over and over. Um, and I'll often watch them on sort of a freeze frame kind of thing where I'll pause it and scroll and I'll pick up on things that parents haven't picked up on by seeing the whole child and watching the whole episode. So yeah, I would get everything you're seeing in that situation on video, uh, including hands, feet, abdomen, chest, um, and show it to your physicians. Um, so that he or she can say, oh, you know, there's clearly something there when I look at the whole person um, that I didn't realize when I only saw the face. Um, and, and that's the other thing with these events, because the autonomic nervous system um, affects the entire body, um, you'll see things that may be just isolated regionally. I have a young woman that I take care of who had a recent episode, of, first ever episode of autonomic dysfunction where the entire left side of her face, only the left side of her face, right 
down the midline, there was a split, was completely red, completely swollen, like someone had slapped her. It was not painful. Um, it was very red. It was very sweaty. And it was there for like a day, came out of nowhere, and then went away. Um, and it can be, you know, the thing with the autonomic nervous system is it can be that weird. It doesn't have to be a whole body. It can be regionally. It can be segmentally. Um, so, you know, if you're any sort of unusual, you're like, that's not right. Get pictures, get it on video and show people until they listen. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question related to, um, could this be rhythmic movement disorder? So I'm assuming they're talking about PSH and um, with anything else, could there be rhythmic movement disorder involved? Um, I'm not familiar with that term. Rhythmic movement disorder. I'm not familiar with that term. I, I need some, would need some clarification on what, what that phenomenon is. If that person wants to add back in the chat, if they want to elaborate on their question, we can ask it again. I do have another question that was uh, that just came in. Um, this parent wants to know uh, if the, there's a child that they know of being treated for neurostorms with antipsychotics, um, in particularly, uh, I believe it's um, they said Haldol to be precise, and wanted to know this could be could this be helpful or is it counterproductive? Without knowing more specifics, um, difficult to say. Um, the um, the neuroleptics um, all have autonomic activity. Um, the The challenge with the neuroleptics um, in using them is that, unlike the medications that I mentioned. Um, they are very broad medications pharmacologically, meaning that they don't just act on one type of neuron or one type of um, receptor or even one type of neurotransmitter. Almost all of the neuroleptics um, are very broadly acting medications. Um, so my, my philosophy and, and my treatment uh, approach is as close to precision medicine as possible. So um, precision medicine is sort of the, you know, as close to specific for each individual as you can get. Um, and that's why I use agents that have one mechanism of action as opposed to something more broadly. Now, you can use the neuroleptics to treat these kind of phenomena, but in my patient population, who are all very complex to begin with, um, I take a as simple approach as I can um, to prevent problems in that regard. Um, okay, so it looks like a rhythmic movement disorder is um, a condition that occurs um, stereotyped repetitive movements that begin prior to sleep. Um, also known as sleep-related uh, movement disorder. Um, not the same um, off the top of my head, but since I'm just reading about it, I would need to read more to be 100% certain. Dr. Kaufman, so um, is your experience with patients where you have treated them that you have been able to generally get those patients to a state where um, where these episodes are well managed, and uh, if, if they occur, they're only breakthrough? Yes. These can be controlled. And these can be controlled um, with preserving quality of life and not um, leading to, you know, you, treating these does not render the patient uh, unable to enjoy quality of life. My goal. Uh, when I tell every patient this that I meet is to keep your child who he or she is 
but get the unwanted stuff out of the way without changing who they are. Um, and it can be done. Um, you just have to find the people that are willing to, to listen and willing to try. No, that, that's good news. So certainly, um, you know, for, for Bryson, uh, I just so, so I think I've told this to Dr. Kaufman already, but for everybody else, he's been on um, both clonidine and gabapentin and those have helped him. Uh, the, there's fewer episodes, the episodes are less <laughs> severe that he does have, um, but it's still, there's still days where it's really, really difficult, not just for him, but for, um, you know, for people, teachers at school or for, for us or whoever's with him. So um, it sounds like, it sounds like he, from what you're saying, we're on the right track. We just need to get the, the dosing right. Um, actually, I will ask one other thing. So I, I put this up a little earlier when you were talking, but just some other slides um, about our kids, just the, the, where we saw the videos, just to, to see, you know, that they're not typically the way that we've seen them in the video. Um, so this is is Ashley, who was uh, actually a Gria two um, individual living in uh, the UK. And um, so she's taking a, a different drug, Tegretol, or te I don't know how to pronounce it, Tegretol. Um, Tegretol, yeah. yeah. And so her mother says that this um, had a, a, an impact on the episodes in terms of the frequency. Um, is that something that's that would be a surprise? Well, it really depends on, you know, what what you think the the initial phenomenology is, right? So if the original, if the so carbamazepine is the is the <laughs> generic name of Tegretol. Uh, Tegretol is the U.S. name. Um, so carbamazepine <laughs> is the name that anyone outside the U.S. would know that medication by. Um, it is an agent, it's a very old agent um, that we use very frequently um, in the U.S. to treat a number of different phenomena. Um, it's used to treat epilepsy. It's used to treat nerve type pain. It's used to treat certain movement disorders. Um, um, so, you know, hearing that it has had an impact um, doesn't surprise me because we use it for so many different neurologic phenomena. Um, the way it works, its mechanism of action is it works to uh, decrease the firing of sodium channels on neurons. And as you heard me say earlier, um, some of these phenomena, specifically erythromyalgia, um, was first described in patients who have primary mutations in the genes that code for sodium channels on neurons. So, um, you know, and that's why, you know, um, taking an approach of, well, what do you think is the driver for these episodes um, is the right way. Um, so clearly that physician thought, you know, maybe it's, maybe this is a pain phenomenon uh, or a nerve phenomenon or a movement phenomenon, as opposed to a central process uh, like hypothalamic dysfunction. And that's why he or she, she chose carbamazepine. Um, and one other question uh, that, that I have is when you talked about, you know, the, kind of watching for the triggers or, um, you know, the, whether it's comfort or something that scares a child, is, is it basically like is the right way to understand that, that um, those things that are making it, the child uncomfortable or startling them, that that's activating the fight or flight yeah, response? That's yeah. yeah, that's 100 percent. So, you know, we, we all have a, you know, the basic animal instinct of self-preservation, right? So if there's something that disturbs us, uh, startles us, frightens us, makes us angry, um, we who don't have these disorders don't respond by, you know, sweating and heart racing and turning red and becoming uncomfortable. We may startle we may get a little bit scared, but because we don't have a system-wide dysfunction in the way our brains are wired electrically, we're able to not have our whole autonomic system, you know, scream for five minutes to two hours whenever something disturbs us. It's exactly what's happening, Keith. I think 
there was one more question here. Um, well, that you know, was a comment when when uh, a child was on certain seizure medications, her movement went her movements went crazy, and guafacine has helped. Yeah, and and that is the challenge, you know, with movement disorders, neurology, um, many. And this is why so many of my colleagues who treat epilepsy and I um, both uh, manage the same patient um, because there are certain anticonvulsants that can make movement disorders worse. And likewise, there are a couple movement medications, none of them that we really talked about today, that can make seizures worse. So, you know, that's why you, you know, a lot of my patients have two neurologists. They see me for their autonomic dysfunction and movement problems, and they see one of my six epilepsy colleagues for their seizures. Um, because you know, you often need kids that are this complex more than one neurologist um, to manage everything well. Well, it looks like we've you've, you've answered all the questions, and uh, really want to thank you. I don't know if you know, people on the call don't know, but this is actually the second presentation that Dr. Kaufman's done today to uh, to patient families. And so really wanna thank you for everything that you're doing, for taking the time with us today and really trying to put this phenotype on the map so that um, it gets better recognized and more of our kids can get the help that they need. So thank, thank you very much for being here and thanks for everything you do. My absolute pleasure. Have a nice day or thank evening, you. depending on where you are. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone.